Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. The first machine age was about harnessing the raw horsepower of mechanical machines. The second one, the one we're in now, is about thinking machines, how to control them and harness their growing intelligence, and more generally, how to make them free, perfect, and instant. In this episode of Brave New World, I discuss issues at the nexus of AI and economics with Eric Brynjolfsson, co-author with Andy McAfee of the best-selling book, The Second Machine Age. Eric has spent most of his career at the Sloan School of Management at MIT and moved recently to Stanford, where he's a professor and senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. I've known Eric for a long time as a colleague and friend in the tech world, But it's been a while since we've had a conversation, which is always a pleasure. And I always come away thinking a little bit differently about the world. I'm expecting this to be no different. Eric, welcome to Brave New World. I'm delighted to have you on the show. Thanks, Vasant. It's great to see you again and have a chance to talk about these issues. Are you out on the West Coast at the moment? I am. I'm sitting in my house on the Stanford campus. The sun is shining, so I'm enjoying uh, good California weather right now. I'm a full nine hours ahead of you in Sweden, and uh, I'm guessing that your ancestors from your last name were from this part of the world. That's correct. I was born in Denmark, uh, in Ruskild, and my dad is from Iceland, which is where the name Brynjolfsson comes from. How about that? We actually flew through Iceland on the way here. I I was told that I should have stopped there for the hot springs and that lake, so... I encourage you sometime when you get a chance. I love stopping there. I have a lot of relatives there, so I, they show me around, but there's so much natural beauty. Uh, you'll have a good time if you can make some time for it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, so talking about which, I also drove out to the west coast of Sweden. There's a wonderful place called Fjellbaka, and a friend loaned me his self-driving car. And, you know, three hours into the drive, it says, you know, I was thinking I should get a coffee and an image of a cup of coffee comes up. It's saying, du er trött, which translates in Swedish into you are tired. <laughs> you, know, and a, you know, and a cup comes up and I'm like, how did it know I'm tired? Oh my I God. am feeling kind of a little bit tired. And uh, Do you think it did it just by the time or, or do, some of them have cameras on now that they look at if you, if you start nodding off, they'll, they'll warn you. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I did wonder. So, I, you know, I kept driving and 50 kilometers later, it says it again. And a, you know, and a bigger cup comes up. And so I said, I'd better stop here. Otherwise, you know, I have no idea whether it's just going to pull over to the side of the road and say, I'm not driving. They'll report yeah. me to the insurance company and say, you know, I warned him twice and he didn't stop. Was it, uh, what kind of, was it a Volvo? What kind of car was it? No, it was a Volkswagen, you know, relatively new. And I love the adaptive, intelligent cruise control and everything. So, yeah, I sort of like that. It sort of adjusted its speed on its own. Well, I have a friend. You can have her on the show sometime if you haven't already. Uh, Rana El Kaloubi, who has a uh, AI startup out of the MIT Media Lab that does analyzes video for micro emotions. Um, you know, are you happy, sad? But also one of the, I think they just sold the company, I think, to a car company because one of the best applications turned out to be seeing whether drivers were paying attention or whether they're nodding off. So maybe that's even using that technology. On the way back, I was wondering, you know, so I started yawning deliberately and I thought, you know, it's watching me. And then I sort of played with the steering wheel a little bit. And then I said, I'd better stop. You know, it might report the owner of this car to the insurance company. You know, you have no idea these days, you know, whether you're being watched by a machine. The mass surveillance that's very feasible now. Yeah, Absolutely. So Eric, you know, I, I thought we'd start with you know setting the stage with your best-selling book, The Second Machine Age, which came out in 2014. And I must say that your timing was immaculate because you know I've been in the field of AI for all of my career, and I'm just amazed at where we've come in the last five or six years, especially. Yeah, me too. You know, when I read your book when it first came out, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds good to me, sounds feasible, sounds possible, but I've just been amazed at, you know, having lived through several AI winters at the speed at which, you know, we progressed. It just completely blows my mind. But I thought we would take a few minutes and sort of recap what you 
said in that book, what the main themes were and what surprised you and maybe the kinds of things you overlooked. Just sort of set the stage here for that. Well, uh, yeah, we were we were fortunate with that book. We really caught a, a wave there of transformation of the economy. You know, we saw some early aspects of it beginning to happen. And uh, it, it came out of an earlier book called Race Against the Machine, where we looked into these issues in a more narrow way. But it kind of started with a basic question of what does it take to change the world? And one answer is that it takes a power system to physically move things around and a control system to know what to do and how to do it. The Industrial Revolution did a lot to automate the physical part of that equation. Uh, you know, powerful GPTs or general purpose technologies like uh, the steam engine uh, began to replace and augment our muscles. But humans were still the control system. But now, in the past uh, few decades, we're in an era that Andy and I called the second machine age, where machines are not just doing muscle work or physical work, but also augmenting human intelligence. And ultimately, I think the second machine age is going to be even more important for human civilization, our living standards, than the uh, industrial revolution that, that mostly addressed the physical muscle side of the equation. Computers and different kinds of software have been driving this for over 50 years, as you know. Yeah, you've been very intimately involved in doing a lot of the, the core work. Just recently, AI has really taken off. When we wrote the book, we talked about this second machine age and What's different now is, I guess you could call it the second wave of the second machine age. The first one being that we humans told the machine step-by-step step exactly what to do. You know, traditional coding, it really means codifying knowledge step-by-step. Step. And, and, and all those of us who have coded before, you have to be very precise about what you want the machine to do. And if you're not precise about knowing it, the machine's going to mess up. Um, so you're basically translating instructions from your brain into machine-executable form. But the machine learning revolution, especially the past you know five or ten years, is having machines learn to solve problems on their own, and that's done a lot better than it did before. Deep learning systems and other kinds of supervised learning systems have just been able to solve problems faster than I think Andy and I anticipated in areas like vision, many kinds of problem solving, uh, language, uh, voice recognition, especially using these deep neural nets. I think it, it has actually happened a bit faster uh, than we expected. And, and, and part of that is because we just have a lot more data, um, a lot more digital data to work with. Part of it is that hardware itself has gotten a lot more powerful. Um, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude or more improvements in, by using GPUs uh, and TPU specialized processing that speed up the analysis. And also there's been some improvements in the algorithms. When you put them all together, and now these machines can uh, can solve a lot of problems that previously only humans could solve. I sometimes tell people that my first exposure to AI was, you know, I was a PhD student. You know, we'd gone to ask this professor, Harry Popel, who had built a system called Internist to offer a course on expert systems. You know, and I saw this physician talking to, he built the first medical diagnostic system that covered the field of internal medicine. And I saw him talking to the computer and he was discussing a case and he'd entered a bunch of symptoms and the system had asked him questions and he provided answers. And at one point, the you know, system asked him another question, like, was there a pain somewhere or the other? And then the physician said, why? And the machine said, well, because the evidence you've given me so far is consistent with the following hypotheses. And this question will help me discriminate between the top two, right? And this was 1979, and it just blew my mind. I was like, how the hell is a machine doing it? And I then realized that it had taken them 10 years to handcraft that knowledge base, right? So the machine was incredibly accurate in terms of its diagnosis. But it took so long to build it. And you know, the difference now is that you don't need that human to translate what's happening to a patient and express it in some clumsy language to the machine, right? The machine just sort of ingests the images, the vibrations, the sounds. And that's what's kind of really blown my mind is that it's eliminated that sort of knowledge engineering bottleneck that plagued AI for decades, right? That's exactly right. You know, you and I have a little bit of a similar history because I actually did a lot of work with expert systems back in the 1980s as well. Right after I graduated, I set up a little a company to build 
expert systems, rule-based systems. And I remember um, studying mycin and some of the other tools that, uh, that did medical diagnosis that Ed Feigenbaum here at Stanford pioneered and others. And uh, to make them work, you had to sit down and, you, you, yeah, use the word knowledge engineering, sitting and asking a human exactly what questions they would ask and, and painstakingly writing it down in, in, in hundreds or often thousands of rules. And that was a real bottleneck. The difference now is that you show machines lots of examples and they start inferring what the answers are. Uh, many cases deriving the same rules that humans do, like uh, you know how you recognize a, a cancer on a medical image. But what's fascinating is sometimes they come up with new insights, new rules that no human had noticed before because they're learning it directly from the data. And that's, uh, that's pretty powerful, not, in term, not just in terms of reducing or eliminating that bottleneck, but also in terms of discovering new kinds of knowledge. Yeah. And, and in fact, that's what's made it, you know, and you referred to sort of this general purpose technology, right? That's what's taken it yes. from being an application or a subfield of computer science to actually a general purpose technology where like right out of the box, this thing just can learn some pretty amazing things and actually become general purpose you know, <laughs> as you referred to it. I want to pick up on what you just said, the general purpose. I mean, that's a, that's a, a term that, that Tim Bresnahan and Manuel Trachenberg coined uh, 20, 25 years ago. And it refers to this class of technologies like the steam engine or electricity that are not just powerful in and of themselves, but also enable lots of complementary innovations. You know, uh, with electricity, there's, whether there's a light bulb or, or computers or electric motors and refrigeration, these are all things that are enabled by uh, electricity. Um, similarly, artificial intelligence, I think, arguably is the ultimate general purpose technology. When I visit my friend uh, Demis Hassabis over at DeepMind in London, they have this little slogan that their mission is to solve intelligence and then use that to solve all the other problems in the world. Uh, a modest little <laughs> mission that maybe you and I need to up our up our goals a little bit. But um, <laughs> But, you know, you, it's hard to think of anything more general than, than that. You know, intelligence is the ultimate uh, general purpose technology. And, of course, we're far from having artificial general intelligence, but we are chipping away at a lot of areas where previously, you know, we had, had no hope. And that will enable us to solve all sorts of other problems. And there's a whole, you know, plethora of follow-on inventions that are coming from AI and, and machine learning. Yeah, I know. Amazing. I mean, you know, for most of my career, I felt like most people really didn't take AI seriously. And now it's just become this sort of tsunami and it's just just everywhere. So I, I sort of tend to think of you as sort of Mr. Productivity mm -hmm. in more senses <laughs> than one. <laughs> but you more than anyone else have studied productivity around technology. And, you know, I remember the, the 1987 Robert Solo quote, you know, about technology being everywhere except in the productivity statistics or something like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and then you became really well known for showing that it did matter, that it actually eventually did show up. But before we sort of get into the details of that, just for the listeners who are not specialists, tell us why productivity matters. Like, why is it important to understand productivity? Sure. Well, productivity is, is the concept of how much output you get divided by how much input you put in. And as Bob Solo in his Nobel Prize work back in the 50s showed, that's basically what drives all of our living standards. It's not because we work harder than people did, you know, a century ago. Uh, probably a lot of us work less, certainly less, less sweat. And it's not necessarily because we have more capital. It's because we are able to do more with less. And that's advances in technology, more output per unit input. And ultimately, that's what drives living standards. Sounds like a bear commercial, by the way. I, I couldn't resist that. You know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. So, so it's uh, more filling uh, or whatever the answer is. So uh, well, Paul Krugman had, had a good way of saying it, that productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything <laughs> because it's, it's really what determines how well off we are and whether we can solve not just our material problems, you know, how many, I don't know, flat screen TVs we each get, but also um, healthcare and poverty and cleaner environment. They depend on us being able to, to be more productive. Now, when Bob Solo later, as you pointed in 1987, said, we see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics, he was really um, 
indicting, you know, both the concern about low productivity growth, but there's also a concern maybe we weren't measuring things correctly. Because as I sometimes joke, while productivity is easy to find, output divided by input, there's only two parts of it that are difficult to measure. One of them being output <laughs> and the other one being input. And so we are missing a lot of the, the, the value that's being created in terms of product variety and choice and, and higher quality. Um, a lot of aspects of our living, uh, you know, it, like one thing I'm working on right now is just measuring um, the value of digital goods. You know, we do a lot of stuff on Zoom or we read Wikipedia, things that, that I get for free, but they create a lot of value for me. But they don't contribute to GDP as it's traditionally measured, and therefore they don't contribute to productivity as it's traditionally measured. So that's a, that's a measurement problem. But there are also some real issues in terms of us not translating the technology into the benefits as quickly as we as we should be, and, and that's the other part of the of the paradox. So I, I want to discuss something with you, and sort of I have this gripe with economists, and you're exactly the right guy to express it to because you can set my head straight. You know, whenever I read these papers by economists, they always talk about labor and capital and I nod along. And then I ask myself, but what about data? Are they sort of missing something important in the picture here? And this came up in, in one of my previous pods with Paul Sheard, who's a macroeconomist. And it was in a completely different context, we were talking about why interest rates are so low and whether technology is this deflator. And we talked about the fact that a lot of tech innovation these days is resource light, capital light. Creating a Boeing is completely different than creating a Facebook in terms of the technology. You know, 30 programmers over a certain period of time can actually create Facebook's infrastructure, right? There's, there's not a lot of stuff there, whereas, you know, with Boeing, you know, that's not happening, right? Every innovation is sort of painful. It's secretly, zealously guarded. China is going to have a harder time copying Boeing than it's going to have copying Facebook. And when I think of it, companies like Facebook, my colleague and friend, Jan LeCun, who heads Facebook AI Research, they make their algorithms publicly available. Same is true of Google, GPT-3, and all these amazingly powerful algorithms are essentially publicly available. So all of that innovation is available to anyone who wants it almost instantly. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into creating these algorithms, just like there is in creating innovation at Boeing. And yet Boeing doesn't share its innovation, but Facebook and Google do. It's like, hey, here's the algorithm, makes it into a Python library. And yet these companies are incredibly valuable. And so when I think about it, I ask myself, is it coming from capital? Is it coming from labor? And, and it just rings hollow to me. And I have to you know, ask myself, it must come from somewhere else. And that somewhere else maybe is data. So why do economists sort of keep ignoring data and focus sort of singularly on labor and capital? Well, that's a good question. That's a key question. You and I are both in the uh, information systems field in, in, in academia. And I think you know, modestly, that's one area that we have a, a, a head start on most economists is that we're constantly looking at data and software and seeing the transformative effect it's having on companies. Maybe that's why we got attracted to the field in the first place. And I agree, economists don't spend enough time thinking about it. And, and my mission, I think one of your missions is to get more people to pay more attention to it. And over time, I'm sure it will become a bigger part of the economic production function. Just like, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, capital wasn't really a part of the production function. People maybe talked about uh, labor and land, and now now um, capital is, is obviously a much bigger part of it in machinery. But, but now, in recent years, data and software is becoming more important. I think it's more than just data. There is something, a unique characteristic that some of these companies have that is not something that can be replicated. If it were something that everyone had access to, they wouldn't get the competitive advantage. They wouldn't have the multi-trillion dollar market caps. I think Facebook just joined the trillion dollar club, uh, just as we're getting on this podcast here. Uh, the fifth company, uh, along with uh, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google in the United States, and, and arguably Tencent and, and, and Alibaba are close behind over in, uh, in China. They're all companies that are data and software intensive. That wasn't the case uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago when the leading companies were, were companies like uh, 
Exxon or Philip Morris or uh, or General Electric. So it, it's a it's a fundamental transformation of the economy. And you touch on another really important point that these companies tend to have a lot fewer employees. Um, you know, uh, a coder can scale their efforts very cheaply. Uh, software and information goods in general have three properties, three adjectives that you can describe them with that don't apply to other goods and services. Free, perfect, and instant. You know, the marginal cost is pretty close to zero once you've made that first copy. The copies are exactly identical to the original. It's not like physical things that are very hard to replicate. You can make a a bit-by-bit replica. And uh, instant, you can transmit it anywhere in, in your company or anywhere in the country or anywhere on the planet, basically at the speed of light, which is pretty close to instant. And that's something, again, that doesn't apply to most physical goods. Those adjectives lead to a very different kind of economics than what Adam Smith describes. So we're in a, well, we're in a brave new world, as your, as your podcast describes it, that, that has some, some different no- expectations. And I, I, one of my missions is to reinvent part of the economic text that takes account these characteristics, because I think they're important not just to those big tech companies that I just listed and software in general, but they're becoming important in in every company. You do a lot of work in finance. That's been one of the leading areas where these characteristics have become more important because it's a very data intensive industry, but it's happening in manufacturing and retailing and and all kinds of services. So ultimately, as uh, Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world and uh, every industry is becoming a data intensive and software intensive industry. Yeah, I mean, that would be an amazingly interesting and timely and useful book to write, I think, because... I'm working on it. <laughs> have me back in a year or so, and I will have the, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the book out. Yeah, I hope. In fact, two of the other terms that economists use are non-rival and non-excludable. So Exactly. Because a lot of these technologies are non-rival, meaning anyone can use it, right. and, you know, and they can also be non-excludable. So it's almost like you get the best of everything by giving away stuff for free and creating tremendous business value. You can, exactly. Although it's, it's more complicated than that. I mean, it, and in many cases, as you know, companies will intentionally destroy the non-rivalry and non-excludability in order to capture more rents. And so they will put you know, copy protection and, and uh, patents and uh, trade secrets and a lot of other tools to prevent other people from learning what they have and that allows them to get better rents in finance. And that's incredibly important is that not everybody has, if you, everybody has the same information, you can't make excess returns. So you have to have a bit of an edge. Um, so the tricky thing is that, that we have built an incredibly successful wealth creating uh, set of institutions based on market capitalism and that fundamentally do rely on property rights and excludability. And that works well for you know, physical land or for objects, pieces of equipment. Because, you know, the nature of physics is you can't have, you know, the same object can't be in two places at the same time. But with software, those physics no longer apply. We have kind of uh, jerry-rigged trying to squeeze a software into the traditional market economy. And it works not bad. I mean, a lot of wealth is still being created. But I think you hit a really important point that potentially it could do a lot better. We could share the information and create a lot more wealth. The trick is to still have the incentives. And in some areas, like, like two-sided networks, um, people have found out ways that you can make a lot of money by giving stuff away for free. And uh, you give one side of the market away for free, and you earn money on the other side. And, uh, and some of the most profitable companies in the world are, are using these kinds of techniques. And it would be counterintuitive in the traditional economy to, to give stuff away for free and, and earn high profits. But it actually works in the, in the network digital economy. It's interesting. I mean, I I want to come back to policy issues at some point because we're seeing a lot of head scratching on Capitol Hill and lawmakers trying to get their heads around the implications of technology and regulation. But before we get there, I just want to push a little bit more on where all this productivity is taking us. One of the things I asked Paul Sheard was if and when we get to the point, actually, I guess people like Jan and lots of other people don't think there's an if there, but when, we get to the point where machines do almost everything better than humans. We're away from that yet, but when we get there, you know, could we be in a situation where 
a thousand companies with a thousand employees satisfy most of our needs. And, and this reminds me of this article by Keynes in 1930, which was titled something like on the economic prospects of our grandchildren. Right. Right. And he wrote that during a period of readjustment, not too much unlike a period of readjustment that we're going through now. His view was that, you know, humans have sort of needs that are insatiable and those that are satiable. <laughs> you know, we have things that we need, shelter, food, et cetera, and then insatiable, which are sort of relative needs. But the basic needs, he speculated, could very well be satisfied in 100 years. And, you know, we're 90 plus years from that. I guess his essay has proved to be remarkably uh, prescient. Because you know, I wonder now whether we are, at least in the industrialized world, close to solving that economic problem. That is, for most of our history, we've struggled with subsistence. And now we have, you know, you use the term bounty in the second machine age. And notice that you continue to use that term a fair bit. And we do have a lot of bounty that's been bestowed on us from you know, technology and progress. So are we getting to that point where we should start thinking seriously about what Keynes was talking about? Well, we, I do think we should take it seriously. Keynes was very prescient in getting almost spot on what our economic standard of living would be. He extrapolated uh, the exponential growth in productivity and economic growth um, to the current era. And uh, it's been fairly steady. So his numbers were, were roughly correct. Uh, recessions and wars notwithstanding. And that means that he was about right in terms of how much wealth and income we have per capita. Where he was incredibly wrong was he assumed that since we'd be so wealthy, we would end up wanting to work a lot less. You know, a wealthy person of his era, an aristocrat, uh, spent most of their time, you know, I don't know, hunting foxes and sipping tea, and they didn't work that many hours. So he kind of figured, well, if you're going to have all that wealth, why, why work? But most of us work, work pretty hard, um, work a lot of hours. And I think what he miss, miss got wrong was that, um, you know, there's a, not, a lot of things we can spend money on that he didn't imagine back then. We have a lot more goods and services. And I guess the optimistic version is, is just, you know, these services create a lot of value. And I just bought a, an air purifier I'm looking at that just arrived from Amazon. And so I have cleaner air and there's other things that, that maybe he wouldn't have included in the bundle, consumption bundle. A more cynical version and you touched on this, is that, uh, you know, humans are status-seeking animals. Um, we're really wired to care about not just our absolute position, but our relative position to other people. And of course, that can never, you know, we can't all be the top dog um, simultaneously. So there's always this status competition to get, you know, shinier, bigger new cars and, and jets and yachts that are a little bigger than our uh, fellow billionaires' yachts. So no matter how much wealth you have, I guess there's always a, a, a status competition that keeps driving us. And for whatever reason, humans seem to be willing to work a lot harder and not be satisfied with, uh, with the wealth that an aristocrat had back then. I mean, frankly, by many measures, it's, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison. You know, the average person or even a poor person today is wealthier than an aristocrat was back in, in 1930. You know, just look at what you might have on an iPhone in terms of having access to the world's libraries and the world's video and having any music performer and, and all sorts of things they couldn't even imagine, you know, GPS and health checks that uh, that would have cost, uh, you know, been priceless back in, in the 1930s. So, uh, you know, we are in some ways uh, much, much wealthier. Now, what does that mean? I think part of it's a psychological question, you know, how much is enough? Um, there are people who feel comfortable with the wealth they have. And, and, and most of us, if we wanted to, we could work a lot fewer hours and, and uh, have the food and clothing that we have. There's also a distribution issue that even with all this wealth, a lot of people still are in poverty and we're not distributing it very evenly. And, and we could distribute it much more evenly. I don't think we're at the stage yet. And, and maybe Jan LeCun will would be a better person to ask. But, but the AI folks I've talked to, I don't think we're at the stage yet of having AI be able to replace all the things that humans can do. Um, there's still, humans still have big advantages in many areas, and I think will for, for decades. So we're not on the verge of artificial general intelligence or replacing all human labor. And uh, even with this wealth, there's still plenty of 
tasks that humans need to do. When I when I look out on the street, I see so much work, so many unmet needs that need to be done that can only be done by humans, whether it's in, in healthcare or childcare or cleaning the environment. You know, our best machines can't do most of those tasks. So I don't think we're on the verge of like the end of work or anything like that. We'll we'll have plenty of work for humans to do for for you know, I think decades. So this reminds me of, you know, one of your sort of sort enduring themes in, in your research has been that along with technological innovation, you need lots of complementary investments to really derive real value from the technology. Do, do you think that's equally true of technologies like AI, where software writes software, as opposed to older technologies like electricity, the steam engine, where you still needed humans and redesigning processes and all that kind of stuff that takes a while to get into place to sort of derive that value from the technology, right? So, because that's what I sort of found myself thinking about, you know, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but is it equally true with these newer technologies that, you know, where software writes software and these companies tend to be much less labor intensive. They got these massive behemoths. They are less labor intensive, but I still think that there's a huge role for these complementary investments. And one way to quantify that, I have a new paper called Digital Capital and Superstar Firms with uh, Sunny Tambe, uh, Lauren Hitt, and Daniel Rock. And we look at, at basically the Tobin's Q ratios, how much market value there is relative to the specific investments in different kinds of capital. And the difference is the intangibles. And those intangibles are huge. And most of them are business process innovations, organizational capital, some of it's human capital. But the ratios are on the order of 10 to 1. What that means is that for every dollar of software or hardware investment, there are about another 9 or $10 dollars of organizational capital investment that need to be made. And those take time. So for instance, if you install a big uh, ERP system, enterprise resource planning system, th that may cost uh, 10 or $20 million for the software, but there's another 100 or $200 million of, of process engineering. Folks at Accenture and other companies will be happy to help you with that. Um, a lot of human capital investment, managerial time to reinvent your business processes. And if you don't do those business process reinventions, you simply don't get the value from the software. Um, that it, it rarely, if ever, works to bolt on technology onto an existing organization. Sometimes you even need to reinvent the whole business model. Um, let me give you like an example. We we're just talking about Amazon. I mean, imagine if uh, if Bezos in in the early 1990s had walked into a bookstore and said, "Hey, I could automate this. Look at this cashier. Instead of having a human cashier." I could have a robot cashier and let's take out the human and replace it with the robot and leave everything else the same. I think we could agree that that would have been the most boring and low productivity way to automate a bookstore. Instead, what he wisely did was say, let's step back and reinvent how you get books to people. We don't need a physical bookstore. We don't need a cashier. We're going to have a browser that is available, millions of browsers on different people's desktops and we're going to have centralized warehouses, et cetera. So it's a whole reinvention of that, not just that uh, function, but, that, but the whole industry. And that's the kind of rethinking that I think AI is enabling in many, many industries. For that matter, the internet and other technologies did as well. And our, our paper, Digital Capital and Superstar Firms, shows that not only is that happening with AI and other technologies, but if anything, there's more of a winner-take-all effect than before that a few leading companies are doing most of it. Um, so the reason that we have the superstar firm in the title is that when we broke it out by deciles, almost all of the intangible capital was being created by about the top 10% of firms in the economy, a little bit in the next 10%, but the bottom 80% of the firms were hardly doing any. And it wasn't just the, the software giants um, that we all hear about. If you did it by industry, within each industry, there were a few leading firms that were pulling away from the rest. So we're having not only a big investment in intangibles that complement the technology, but also uh, a relatively small number of companies that are pulling further and further away 
the leading frontier is getting further from the median or the average than it was 10 or 20 years ago. So let's push on this a little bit more. This is really interesting because this winner-take-all aspect of these technologies, is that leading to massive concentration and inequality in a fundamental sense? And what I mean by inequality is that just like you have these superstar firms, you can now have superstar anything, like superstar professors or superstar whatever, right? The people who, they, they sort of break away from the pack. And so you're left with this widening inequality. And so even though the poorest are better than the aristocrats of the 19th century, minus the 15 serfs waiting on them, it's still creating this sort of two-class society and massive inequality. Is that one of these inevitable aspects of tech? Well, there is. And, and you're, you're exactly right. It, you could apply it not just to companies, but also individual occupations. And we are seeing growing inequality in the United States and other countries. The, the wages of the top 1%, the income of the top 1% is a bigger and bigger share. And now it is more than the income of the bottom 50%. It didn't used to be that way. So there's been a, a, a real uh, phenomenon of growing inequality, especially at the very top high incomes. Uh, there are a number of causes, globalization, tax structure, but, uh, but I'm in the IT business, so I can't help but look at technology as one of the main drivers. And indeed, I think most economists would agree with me that, that the nature of the way the technology is being used is a big driver of inequality. I mean, think about just my example before of, of free, perfect, and instant, those, that technology, um, that leads to a different kind of competition. And um, it's what Sherman Rosen called the economics of superstars in a, in a paper back in the early 1980s, where instead of having a, a bunch of humans each competing with each other, if you can amplify the talents or the skills or, for that matter, the luck of one of the people through software and digitization, they can serve all the markets simultaneously. And then the consumers, you know, they're going to look at the different choices. And most of the time, they're just going to choose the one best, you know, tax preparer or the one best singer or the one best whatever, uh, rather than equally distribute their spending across all of the, the competitors. So that one person who's even just a little bit better than number two or number three is going to get a way disproportionate share of the market. And that's exactly what drives this uh, this huge inequality in, in outcomes. So we're seeing it exactly as you say, not just in, in, in companies, but also in individual incomes. And it is a, a problem that I think uh, a lot of people are getting more and more concerned with because when you have concentration of wealth, that also tends to lead to concentration of power. And it leads to the people who aren't in that 1%, uh, understandably thinking the system's not working for them very well. Right. So this gets us back to this notion of universal basic income, that maybe this is so inevitable that you're going to have this two-class structure that people who just don't have the skills or the wherewithal just get left behind. And so what do you do about that? As an economist, you know, I guess you'd say markets are great at creating wealth, but not necessarily at distributing it. So is that where policy comes in? And how do we think about this redistribution problem? Like, what's your thinking on this? I think redistribution has to be and is part of the solution. Um, but I wouldn't put all the emphasis just on ex post redistribution. I would really think harder about how we can level the playing field in terms of opportunity and get more people to take more shots on goal, make it easier for people to, to start companies and to try new ideas and to explore new opportunities. And that often means improving education and making sure people have the kinds of skills that are needed in the 21st century economy. Right now, our education structure is, is woefully geared towards kind of a 20th century Henry Ford production, mass production uh, style set of skills. And we need to have more investment in creativity and getting more people to create more of the goods and services that, that people want. And I also think tools like the earned income tax credit can be beneficial which keep people engaged in the workforce, but to redistribute money towards them. It's basically a, a wage subsidy. So unlike uh, universal basic income, 
it encourages people to stay engaged. And I think there's two main reasons why we, we'd like to see people engaged in the workforce, at, le- at least you know, for the next few decades until we do get those incredible AI machines. One is that there's a lot of psychological research, and I was persuaded by Bob Putnam and others, that people get benefits from work and having a sense of purpose and contributing. And if you simply write them a check, a lot of people aren't very happy and they can become, you know, turned towards suicide or drug abuse. There, there's communities where that has happened in a, in a very counterproductive way. So it's nice to have people, give people a sense of purpose that they are contributing, that they're doing something important. And uh, maybe over time, our psychology will change. But for now, that does seem to be part of what, what creates well-being. The second point is what I said earlier, that there's still just so much work that needs to be done in our economy. I don't think we're at the point where we we ha- can have machines do everything. I would not want a, a robot, you know, taking care of a two-year-old or, or coaching an eight-year-old in soccer, or uh, for that matter, you know, persuading a set of uh, folks in a company to to work on a new product or uh, negotiating or persuading a, a customer. I think there are a lot of things that involve emotional intelligence that we want to have humans involved in the interpersonal connection. There's also a lot of things involving creativity, scientific discovery, entrepreneurship that machines for now are not that good at, and we need humans to be working on those. And uh, so if you add up all the things that machines cannot do, it's a big chunk of the economy. And let's uh, let's solve those problems and have people working on those problems before we, we say, hey, you know, everyone can stop working. So the, the Arthur C. Clarke quote that you had in your second machine age, that the goal of humanity is full unemployment so we can all play. I'm guessing you're taking that with a grain of salt. Well, you know, I think the big question is the time frame. And I am an optimist about what technology can eventually do, but I'm also a realist about the time frames. You know, productivity growth has been averaging barely 1% per year. I just made a long bet with Bob Gordon, my uh, friend and and nemesis, who's always more pessimistic than I am, that it's going, I I would say it's going to be 1.8%. The Congressional Budget Office says it's going to be 1.4%. But, you know, Whatever the exact number turns out to be, it, I don't think it's likely to be 5 or 10 or 50% per year anytime soon, the way uh, maybe Ray Kurzweil or other anticipated it may be. So we're not going to get to that world of uh, mass abundance of, of machines being able to do all the work of humans very soon. Someday, maybe 50 years from now, I'm not sure. I hope I live to see it. Uh, machines will be super powerful and, and be able to, to have us all take care of all of our needs. And we will perhaps live in Arthur C. Clarke's world where, where we can play and, and we find other ways to get a sense of purpose other than uh, than doing the work that a machine could do just as well. But I, I want to, most of my work focuses a little more near term, um, you know, in the next five years, next 10 years. And for that period, the problem isn't that there's a lack of work that needs to be done. It's that we need to rethink how we distribute the benefits and get and redeploy people to the many tasks, as I mentioned, in childcare, healthcare, cleaning the environment, that I think desperately need to be done and should not be left undone. Yeah, that's really well said. So what's our role as educators in this process? Because we're living in this state where there's declines in life expectancy, that a lot of the gains of the previous decades have been reversed. We've fallen behind relatively in some ways to, to other countries. I mean, what's our role as educators? Well, it we have a big role. I think everyone does, but I think it's a tragedy. You know, you and I started this conversation talking about the amazing progress in technology, but equally shocking to me has been the disappointing performance of our political institutions and our society in terms of harnessing those benefits. And the sad truth is that big chunks of Americans are worse off than they used to be. And some people say, well, there's a measurement problem. But you know, there's not a measurement problem in life expectancy. There's not a measurement problem in, in suicides and drug abuse and alcoholism and many of the other, these other social indicators. The death rates for um, People in America age uh, 25 to 34 is higher now than it was five years ago. The death rates for um, all high school or graduates or less is higher than it used to be. This is what uh, uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton called deaths from despair. So those people are genuinely suffering. 
And we need to do a better job of harnessing these amazing technologies to, to help them out. I don't think it's just a matter of writing checks. I think it's a matter of reskilling the workforce so that they can genuinely feel like they are contributing and they genuinely are contributing to those many unanswered problems that we still have to address. I think it's a matter of redesigning our tax structure, of redesigning our competition systems right now. You know, I was surprised to see that entrepreneurship is down in the United States. There are fewer startups. There are fewer young companies, young less than five years old. We're becoming a stagnant society that doesn't have the opportunity for dynamism and mobility that it did uh, 20 or 50 years ago. So we need to do a better job of giving people more opportunity and having them be able to contribute. That's what's going to make them happier. And that's going to, what's going to help solve our uh, economic problems faster than if we simply put all the burden on robots to, to take care of us. So it's a, it's a different mindset. And one of the things I want to emphasize, you and I talked about the growing inequality and the way that there's these winner-take-all societies. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. We could, by doing some of the things I just mentioned, have a society that has more widely shared prosperity, more equitable distribution, not just of income, but of opportunity. And that is one that I think almost everybody would be in favor of. So maybe the most important thing you and I can do and other everyone listening to this can do is just realize that we have the agency. Uh, one of the points I like to emphasize in, in my writings is that AI doesn't decide for us what our goals are. You know, technology doesn't decide what our outcomes are. These are tools, you know, like shovels or anything else. And the more powerful your tool is, more or less by definition, the more power we have to change the world. And that means we have more agency than we did before. So we need to think, what are our values? And stop and take a deep breath and say, what kind of society do we want to live in? And let's use these tools to shape us in that direction rather than passively sit back and say, gee, I wonder what's going to happen. It's our choice, not AI's choice. Indeed. And, you know, talking about us as educators and universities, one of my guests on this show and, and friend Scott Galloway was actually very scathing towards universities. And he said that universities have become hedge funds. In fact, he said they've become fucking hedge funds, uh, <laughs> you know, in his, in his usual style. And that all we're trying to do is go after the remarkables, you know, and there are lots of people out there that are unremarkable. And he talked about his own childhood and how he felt incredibly unremarkable and how the generous hand of the Californian system allowed him to go to UCLA and, and thrive later on in life. I, I couldn't but help feel that there's a lot of truth to what he's saying. Well, I, I very much agree with that. You know, I'm at a very wealthy university right now, Stanford. I was at MIT before, and they both have these huge endowments. I don't understand when I do talk, get the privilege of talking to the, the president of these universities. I, I say, why don't we admitting more students? Why aren't we providing you know broader financial aid? I have to say, in fairness, they both these universities and most elite schools do provide free tuition for people you know less than I think seventy five thousand or one hundred thousand dollars in income, and, and that's not known as widely as it should be. But I think that we could educate a lot more people, a lot more broadly and expand, and we could harness some of these tens of billions of dollars endowments and change them from financial capital into, into human capital. That would be a, a huge asset to society, and we are meant to be publicly interested organizations. I would love it if the federal government invested more in, in education and training and just increase the human capital of the workforce. There are so many incredibly smart people or people of the potential to contribute and invent things in our society that aren't getting those chances. Uh, most entrepreneurs come from a very narrow strata of uh, middle or upper class people, and they're the ones who have a little bit of the, the flexibility and freedom to take some chances. If we had more shots on goal, if we had more people inventing things, it would be good for them, but it'd be good for all of us. And by the way, that applies globally as well as, as nationally. I, I'm so happy that, that the global economy is contributing more and more to this. There are entrepreneurs in India and Africa and China and, and Europe and around the world that are inventing things that are contributing to this. And I'd love to see more of that as well. But that's the path forward. That's a society that has faster growth and more shared prosperity. I must say, it sort of inspired me to think about getting off my butt and doing my fair bit in trying to make that happen, because I am aware of that 
despair and despondency and inequality. And, and as you said, it doesn't have to be that way. So Eric, before we wrap up, I often ask my guests, especially educators, whether they have any advice for young people who might be tuning into this show, right? Just given this brave new world that we're heading towards, you know, how would you think about preparing for it if you're a high school student or a freshman? Well, that's, that's a great question, you know, and so I'll focus on the, the role of technology. Machines are learning to do more and more tasks well, and I'd start by avoiding the things that machines could do well, like the routine information processing tasks, uh, whether it's, it's, you know, tax preparation or accounting or routine physical work, um, and working on creative areas where machines are not very good, and for that matter, interpersonal areas. Be a, a, as Hal Varian says, try to be a, a complement to things that are becoming abundant and machines are able to leverage you in that way. So the people who have uh, exceptional skills or talents in a particular area are going to be a, a particularly valuable, the superstars of the future. So it really helps to be not just above average in an area, but really be excellent, maybe in a very narrow niche. Find something that you're passionate about and dive in deeply and in my experience, that only happens if it's something you really enjoy doing. So find something that you want to spend, uh, you know, 10, 15 hours a day on and, and work on real hard because you think it's fun. And there's probably a, a market for that somewhere and technology can leverage that. So if, if you follow those guidelines, I think you're going to not only have a more fun life, but also one that contributes more and that leverages technology better. Well said. Listening to that, I was thinking, like, what should I not do? And I was thinking I should probably not become a lawyer because maybe lawyers will be rendered obsolete by AI. And it sort of reminded me of a joke when I was in, you know, I spent six, six months in Austin, Texas, and they, they're very fond of armadillos and these lawyer jokes. And one of them was, you know, what's the difference between a lawyer and an armadillo? And the answer was an armadillo has uh, skid marks in front of it. <laughs> <Our modelo's getting laughs> when it's on crossing the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first year lawyers are increasingly replaced. If you look at the big law firms, they're not hiring as many because of what a lot of they used to do was document discovery, sifting through boxes of documents from the opposing uh, lawyers when they had to find the ones that were relevant for a case. And now machines with natural language processing can, can find things not just cheaper, but frankly, better than uh, young law graduates can. So there's just not as much demand for that kind of routine work. You know, the more skilled work of coming up with strategy, the higher level work, that's still something that machines can't do. And this is a pattern we see in, in most industries. It's not so much that a whole category disappears. It's more that certain tasks are replaced and other tasks actually could become more important, particularly the, the more creative or strategic or ambiguous aspects of the job. Right. I advise people to study philosophy, history, and computing, which is the language of our future overlords. I think so. Uh, which could serve us well in the future. Well, Eric, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and ideas with the rest of the world. I know people tune in from all over the place. So thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Always a pleasure talking to you, Vasant. It was, it was a joy. Thank you. Take care.